kinds of things. We'll just dive into uh, to this. Um, uh, we want to make you aware of, first and foremost, that there is a record review document that is housed on the KDE website. And it, it is what we use to uh, review files, audit files, if you will. And uh, indicator 13, uh, the transition piece, is um, a federal indicator that has great importance. And it is a indicator that deals with post-secondary transition. Uh, it is, um, you know, it has a, uh, a background or a base, uh, a foundation that is rooted in making sure that we're doing what we need to be doing for students with disabilities, that we're providing them with the, uh, a robust plan uh, to enable them to successfully transition uh, into life um, after high school. And so there are a set of requirements that go along with that. And you see on the screen right now, you see that uh, uh, item 51A uh, through I is, um, uh, those are the uh, numbers that are associated with the record review document. So as we dive into that, we see that uh, 51A uh, says that the IEP includes um, appropriate measurable post-secondary goals and and then it goes right on down and this is kind of an overview for you if you will and uh, the slide's a little bit large so uh, the bottom part of it may be cut off but down at the bottom of that uh, if we advance the slide just a little bit you can see uh, uh, you know the, the rest of what what's included there um, so uh, we can we can go back to 51 right there is fine we can get it's flashing. Uh, just, just advance to the next slide, Dion, if you don't care. And we'll go ahead and talk about 51A and what's required there. Um, so 51A, again, that being in the record review document, uh, the IEP includes appropriate measurable post-secondary goals aligned to other available student information, such as present level student entrance or preferences related to training and education, which is required and employment, which is required. So when you write a post-secondary goal, we're looking to see that you've included those pieces in such a way that they're going to uh, meet uh, the compliance requirement. And then when appropriate independent living skills. Now, what we mean by that is sometimes, um, you, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna identify through a transition assessment uh, what the student um, is interested in and what their preferences are and what it says that they're likely to be successful in. And then uh, we're going to try to, to, to identify some training and education that they're going to need to get, and then also to identify a job that they may uh, fit into. And, and we kind of serve as a coach as we move them through the high school years. Now, these are things that are required once the student turns age 16. So we definitely have to have a measurable post-secondary goal included in the IEP at age 16. And the required pieces again are training, education, and employment, and when appropriate, independent living skills. Now, when students have cognition issues to the to the degree that they're going to need support with independent living skills, things like communication and things that you'll find on the adaptive behavior, the the ability to do the day to day uh, life skills, uh, then we would also find that that would be an appropriate time for them to have an independent living skills goal. And that would be a separate goal from the, from the other two, the way we do it in Kentucky. So we can advance to the next slide. So we wanted you, you to, to see, you know, just some examples of what that would look like. So we always see that every goal is after high school. So we're going to have a phrase up front that's going to say in our formula, it's going to say after high school, John Doe's goal is to attend a four year college uh, to major in graphic communication. So you see that we've identified the student's name, uh, that we have uh, inserted a four year college um, and we've identified what they're going to study. And then we have simply said that's going to lead to a job. And that's all that needs to be in there for it to be compliant as a post-secondary goal. So after high school, Jane's Doe, Jane Doe's goal is to attend a technical school. I you know, put in HCTC or Big Sandy uh, to receive a, set, a certificate in electricity to be able to be employed as an electrician. 
So you always want to you know, kind of identify specifically where the student is headed, where you think, and keep in mind, it's a goal. So, uh, you know, you don't have to worry that, uh, you know, if, if they decide later after they leave that they're not going to attend this place or that place, but we want to be specific and we kind of want to gather what their plans are. And then we want to be specific in how we uh, say what we're, what their, what their training education is going to lead to, what type of certificate or what kind of training they're going to get. And then also we want to want to make sure that we include the specific job. We don't say things like I'm going to work in the retail business. We say they're going to be um, uh, an assistant manager uh, at, at a retail uh, location and identify that location. So that would be an example of a compliant goal. And we always, when we talk about compliance and we give you examples, we like to give you non-examples as well. So uh, in what we're talking about there, we would say, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a non-compliant goal if you just say in the retail business, as opposed to saying that the student is going to uh, work as a retail manager. Um, so kind of technical, but it's certainly something that we need to, uh, to pay particular attention to. One of the things that I can go back uh, to the previous slide, we need to have all yeses on all of those indicators. If we were talking 51A through 51I, everything has to be correct. So um, uh, you, can, you can advance beyond that one now, Dion, if you'd like, thank you. So here is kind of the template and, and, and Brenda uh, always points me back to this. Um, we have, we have a template. We don't really want to do these goals for you. We want you to identify these goals based on the, the student's preference and interest. Uh, we, we, need, we need you to be looking at the ILP. We need you to be looking uh, you know, to the, the transition assessments to determine what uh, you know, the student will be doing uh, and, and, and in writing these goals. So after high school, students' names, students' name is there. The goal is to get that education training piece and to be able to become employed. So employment is what specific job does the student want to do? And the training and education piece is what training or education does the student need to help them succeed and gain an employment in the specific job they want. So we can, we can advance on. Okay, let me sort of interject a little bit. Please do. Make sure that we do realistic goals. Um, I know I have read several that may put in that the, the student wants to be a veterinarian or a nurse or a doctor or whatever. Um, but we have to remember what is their cognitive ability? You know, do you think that the child could, can be uh, whatever the child decides he wants to be or she? So if they can't be that, then you might want to suggest, and I, let me just give an example. Uh, when I was uh, teaching, I had a student that wanted to be a veterinarian and there was no way uh, cognitively the, the child couldn't make it, uh, MMD student. So I asked the questions, um, why do you want to be a veterinarian? And this child said, I want to wear a lab coat. Well, there's all kinds of things we can wear a lab coat for, but she still loved animals. And I said, um, well, you can still wear a lab coat uh, at the veterinary clinic, you may want to, uh, you can bathe the dogs, walk the dogs, feed the dogs or, and the animals uh, that come in. Um, that might be something you, you can do. So she agreed to that. That's what she wanted to do. But it was all about wearing that lab coat. So, you know, when you get these um, goals, these students want to be something that it's going to be very difficult uh, for them to become or impossible. Uh, and we hate to say that sometimes, but you know, it's, we have to be realistic with these students and they have to understand that too. So let's just find out why do you want to be uh, whatever you say you want to be. And uh, maybe you can come down with something like the lab code or something else um, and can, can veer them to the right path, uh, something that they enjoy, uh, but, but veer them in the right path. That's a... Uh... A super practical approach to what we lots of times will see uh, with our students. Uh, you know, when they when we start talking about identifying the goal and we we start looking at these assessments and um, you know, lots of times they they want to be um, you know in the wrestling in industry or they want to be 
a big time football player or whatever it might be. And so we just have to gently and uh, provide uh, an empathetic approach to their, their wants and needs. And we, we wanna try to include those. And I think Brenda's given you a perfect example of how you would go about that just based on many, many years of experience of teaching and working with students with disabilities. And we just have to keep in mind that sometimes we just have to serve as that guide and we have to work as a person that's going to uh, you hold their hand and develop that relationship. And you can have those uh, conversations and they can get to be uh, at a level that are more and more difficult and you still have that trust built in as you build that relationship with that student. So here's some examples of post-secondary goals for students with uh, the most significant cognitive, cognitive disabilities. Sometimes we think, well, what is it that the, the student that has, uh, uh, you know, maybe um, is placed in the FMD unit or has a severe disability, those low incidence uh, students, what, what is it that they can do? And there are certainly things that we can find. So we want to give you a couple examples here on this uh, page uh, to kind of cue your uh, thinking. And we want you to be thinking about what your students, if they, if they do fit into that category, what, what, what is it they can do? And so um, sometimes it might be as simple as uh, complying with uh, uh, their parent in dressing themselves. Uh, but it also could be some things like, uh, we've got Sally Sue here, her goal is to receive on the job training at her local church, uh, to be a volunteer, um, to help uh, you know, in, the ch in the children's church as an assistant. Um, so there's lots of things that we can think about. We just gotta have to think outside the box sometimes. And uh, we want to first and foremost, include empathy uh, in these, uh, as we guide these students. Upon completion of high school, Jerry's goal is to receive on the job training at the local library to be able to work as a assistant storyteller. So there's many, many things that you can do with the student that is in that low incidence category uh, if we just put our minds to thinking about it. You can advance. So right here we have a screenshot of, of what it looks like in Infinite Campus um, when we're looking at working with 51A, the post-secondary training goal. Uh, at, you see after high school is, uh, or after graduation or upon completion of high school is, uh, you know, provided as a drop down. So you shouldn't be able to make a, uh, a mistake on that. That's gonna be part of it. And then it's gonna generate that for you. But then there's some things that you have to put in there uh, that go along with the education training behavior. And we've already kind of covered that. And we're going to attend a four-year college to study graphic communications, become a graphic artist. And we might even identify what that, the name of that college is if the student will supply that information for you. If you help guide that student into a possible uh, place of training or uh, you know, a place of uh, education. So, um, and here's uh, uh, also, uh, this one is a post-secondary independent living goal. Uh, and you see the drop down box after high school and then you would put the independent living uh, information in there. So you can advance. And here, here's what it would look like again when it's completed. And you can see that there's a transition service associated with that. And you notice that, and we'll get to this in a little bit, but you notice that multi-year course of study is listed there. We're going to talk about, about that more and the agencies responsible and what, what exactly they're doing there to attend college in a graphic communications school um, and, and get a degree in graphic communications and become a graphic artist. And then some of the services that are, are associated with that is we build that ro robust plan. So we can move on. So then you would have something that's, you know, the uh, infinite campus would uh, show up like this, you would have a goal that, that's going to look somewhat like this. Uh, Infinite Campus changes quite often, and we have uh, a limited access here to co-op, but uh, we try to find screenshots for you so that you can get some idea of what it looks like um, once the post-secondary goal is completed, and we've put it in the drop-down box, and we've put the information in, then it's going to put it in a, a nice, neat package for you. Okay, we can advance. I'm going to pause just for a second as we move to 51B. Are there any questions? If there's questions re regarding 51A, uh, please put them in the chat and we'll try our best to respond to those as we move through. Um, on 51B, um, 
The IEP includes transition services that are needed to assist the student in reaching the post-secondary goal. The ROC must document transition services needed and the agency responsible for each service under the post-secondary goal. For examples of transition services, we're gonna see indicator 13 requirements. Um, you, can, you can advance. So here's some examples of uh, 51B, what transition services would look like. Keep in mind that we, we have to include first and foremost, the post-secondary, uh, or I'm sorry, the multi-year course of study. And then that's what we're saying here, a course of study leading to a diploma or an alternate diploma, and then instructional support of guided notes for lessons. Any type of service that we could think of, job shadowing, community work transition program, those are all appropriate, but then we also identify who's gonna be responsible for providing those services for those students. Lots of times it's the high school, but sometimes it's voc rehab, or sometimes it might be you know, a, a college counselor or uh, you know, admissions counselor or a college uh, disabilities coordinator. We just have to, have to work to identify who's gonna be um, uh, in, uh, responsible for providing those services. So there's a place on the IP uh, under 51B uh, to uh, determine what those transition services are. Now, a lot of what we're gonna decide here is gonna be based on what our transition assessments tell us, what, are, what the barriers are for that student uh, as far as school is concerned, but these are transition service examples that we have um, that we wanted to share with you. So you can move you can move on to the next slide. One of them that we actually forget to put in there, especially if we know they're gonna to go to some kind of college or, or technical um, uh, college is the FAFSA. Uh, you know, we can provide the service to assist the student and the parents with completing the FAFSA form. Uh, so that might be one thing that we'd like to include in that. If, we, if you know for sure that this one's gonna be going to, to college or university. That's a great point, um, and that's something that you know is not easy to do. So, so any kind of instruction uh, that we could give from the school uh, would be key, I would think. Um, uh, the FAFSA is a difficult uh, piece of information to to uh, work your way through. So, it's great. That's a great point. Here's some more examples. Uh, just you know, just want to give you some ideas of examples so that you can think about these things and kind of uh, you know formulate some ideas in your mind. Um, okay, we can move on. And another thing that I was thinking of was the uh, ACT. You could also apply for uh, the accommodations for the student uh, to receive the accommodations for the ACT. Uh, if not, the students will not get the accommodations and they have a, they're a little different animal. They have their own little rules. Uh, even though we may have a reader or a scribe or something in our accommodations, that does not mean that the ACT people will say that they need that, that particular accommodation. So that's another accommodation that we forget to, to do. So that's one thing that I, I keep in mind. Thank you, Brenda. I appreciate that very much. Um, so again, uh, we start seeing that, you know, um, you got your post-secondary goal up there and then you have your transition of ser services that are uh, associated with that and who the agency is that's responsible. So this is kind of what it would look like uh, you know, on that IEP. Fifty one C has to do with uh, agency involvement outside agencies when we talk about agency involvement. So for for transition services likely to be provided or paid for by another agency, the other agency is invited to send a representative if appropriate. Now we can really um, uh, you know, this is a this is one that you know on your ARC notice. Uh, there's a place to invite folks, and if you do invite folks, um, and and you should be thinking about inviting folks uh, as a district, we should be inviting uh, these folks to come to, uh, as an outside agency if if it's appropriate. Now, if it's not appropriate, then we would document why it's not appropriate in the conference summary. But certainly, uh, 51C is something we should consider. Things like voc rehab. Um, you know, there's a place on the, on the ARC notice where you would indicate that. And there's some things that you have to do if you do invite those outside agencies because you are, you're, uh, you're identifying uh, these students that have disabilities and you're releasing directory information to these outside agencies. So we have to get some consent. And that leads us, uh, you know, into the next uh, uh, 51D, which works together with this um, 
agency involvement. Uh, so if you want to advance to the next slide, Dion. I will, Denny. Um, you want to put. D had made a comment in the chat just about like voc rehab and how useful they have been to work with. So yes. I just want. Uh, voc rehab is is very active in our uh, in our region, um, and lots of times they are. Um, uh, very accessible. They will come in and they will meet with students and they'll work with them, particularly in the junior and senior year of high school. They will come in and do the things that we need to have done. But this is a this is a screenshot of an of a ARC notice. And I just wanted to point out just visually down at the bottom, if you see the big blue arrow down there, if you can if you can bear with the uh, the blurred screen at the top, uh, you see voc rehab or other or not appropriate at this time. So when we're doing this, we're getting ready to have our meeting. We want to, if, if the student is um, of the age to be invited for uh, transition, which that starts at about age 13, we, we train it that way when we do a full training in this. Uh, but just notice down there that voc rehab is an option or other, like you know, that, that would be a place where you could put another agency. But anytime you invite these agencies, um, you would have to have an associated consent form and we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. But if you, if you mark not appropriate this time, you need to have some blurb in your conference summary that explains why you're not inviting that outside agency. So it is, a, uh, a, a bond, it, it is the district's responsibility to have that conversation and to decide whether or not it's appropriate to have these outside agencies come to these meetings. Um, so um, the consent for outside agency is, is 51D, the item there. Uh, if an agency was invited to send a representative, prior written consent for the outside agency invitation signed by the parent is included. So what we can say about that is that we want to make sure that when we generate the ARC notice that we have this consent, this individual consent, and we'd have to have an individual one for uh, voc rehab, we'd have to have one for uh, if we invited a representative from, let's say, uh, the Office for Children or or uh, the Office of the Blind or, or whatever outside agency it might be that's not associated with the school system, uh, we would have to have separate in uh, uh, written prior written consents from the parent dated before the day that we generated the ARC notice. So up in the, in the corner, if you can visualize in your mind, there's a date up there where you generate, where Infinite Campus generates a date of where you have actually put that, con uh, that ARC notice into place you would want to get your outside agency prior consent dated at least one day before that, because we do not want to give anyone the impression that we have violated FERPA by releasing that information that, that student exists, that student is in our school, and we're inviting you to this ARC meeting. So we don't want to violate the FERPA law by letting someone know without the parent's consent. So we can move on. So prior consent must be obtained prior to the notice. That's what this slide says here, and we can move on. One of the things that I would, if you want to go back for just a second, Dion, I saw something down at the bottom I probably need to mention. Um, we have to get these notices, we have to get these prior consents signed each year, each time we invite uh, to an ARC meeting, an outside agency, we must have a separate new uh, consent form. And if the student's 18, we have to get them to sign. So that's very important. That's a little bit of a different uh, thing that's emerged in the last two or three years. But we have to have, uh, every time we invite an outside agency, we have to have a new informed consent form for that particular individual agency. And then we have to have the 18 year old sign as well and inform them of what they're given um, uh, the, the informed consent for. Okay, we can move on. So that's what the outside agency uh, form looks like. And we would have an individual one for each one here. Okay, so we can move on. Now 51E says as a transition service, the student has a multi-year course of study needed to assist the student in reaching the post-secondary goals. And that it must be in alignment with the student's ILP as required by law, the 707KAR, which is Administrative Regulation in Kentucky. Uh, Multi-year means at minimum from the current year to the student's expected year of high school. In the event the student's an out-of-state transfer or is identified after the ninth grade year, the multi-year course of study begins at that point of entry. 
and then you would have to go ahead and develop that and you put those courses in. Uh, discussion of the review of the student's multi-year course study must be documented in the conference summary. So I'm gonna repeat that again. We're doing the multi-year course of study. This multi-year course of study actually begins in the, in the eighth grade year or when the student turns 14. So we could even be including this as early as 13, uh, like we said earlier. Uh, and then I want you to think about putting those courses in and really uh, you know, setting that coursework into place uh, to the year of expected, uh, of when the student's expected to exit high school. So we gotta have that filled out in, in its entirety. We do it from the year, you know, if we each, each year we do a new IEP, we do, we look at that, we'll say if the student's in the 10th grade, we would have 10th, 11th and 12th grade if they're gonna graduate at that time. If students are um, on alternate track, we would also need to list the course codes along with that. So if we can advance, Dion, thank you. And uh, this is a screenshot that you'll see uh, that the multi-year course of studies included in with the IEP or it's been uploaded. Now, one thing I would say to you as well is that we, just a few years back, um, the uh, state of Kentucky um, stopped using career cruising as uh, an ILP option. You have to have an ILP for every student starting at grade six in the state of Kentucky. So that, that also goes, on, goes for students with disabilities. If you're audited by the state, they will ask you for a copy of that ILP. So I urge you, if you are a caseload manager or, um, and you're working with a student's folder, you need to make sure that you know where that ILP is. You need to make sure that the ILP includes things like the course of study and that the course of study uh, itself is being informed by the ILP and the information that comes out of the student's preference and interest so that we can guide this student in the uh, proper path. Any questions? Comments? Okay, we can move. So you can see the course of study and those would be filled out for each grade level uh, where the student, uh, you know, whatever student, whatever grade the student's in, let's say if they're in the 11th grade. So that first one on the, on the new IEP, the annual IEP would be 11th grade and then you would have the 12th grade. Uh, and you would have the subject, do not use the word elective. I've heard Brenda say that so many times I hear it in my sleep. You cannot use the word elective. You just keep in mind that these, this is a working document it's okay to change it from year to year. And it's a projection of where the student's headed. And you kind of work like a college counselor uh, or you know, someone that you would, you, know, you go to office hours for that college uh, advisor and they're, they're guiding you through your program. You would do the same thing for the student with disability here and keep, keep them on a proper course to uh, have a successful post-secondary transition. Okay, we can move on. So 51F, uh, this uh, annual goal is related to transition service needs. Now, we're going to have, uh, we want you to realize that, you know, when the, when the IEP, uh, when the students, let's say in elementary school or middle school, uh, there's a lot of time left with that student. Uh, so we, the focal point of the IEP at that, at that particular time in their career might be to increase the skills, and it is to increase academic skills and functional skills so that they achieve at a greater level uh, that's closer to what's expected of them. Now, when we, when we transition into, you know, age 14, age 15, age 16, we start seeing that these goals that are written academically or these goals that are written in the IEP are written so that they can um, support the focal point, which the focal point of the IEP at the high school level is transition, is successful post-secondary transition. So your goals are going to be um, uh, in support of that overall post-secondary goal. And you do that by checking a box, but you also need to think through that. And you'll see that on this, on this slide right here. You need to think through, um, are the annual goals appropriate you know, are the annual goals that we're doing, are they appropriate to support education and training or employment? And, um, you know, if you only have one goal, let's say you've got a kid that's uh, LD uh, and you only have a math goal, uh, you would need to check both boxes under that math goal. But if you had multiple goals, you, can, you, you could check one for education and training and then go to the next goal and check it for employment. But we need to be thinking about 
and this is kind of what it looks like on a screenshot, uh, it would include both of these. So you would need to check both boxes if you only had one goal. But if you had multiple goals, you could check a box for education training and one for employment, if that makes sense. So you can see there, they've got the goal, they got the annual goal, and that annual goal ties back to the post-secondary goal. It's linked back. Okay, we can move. So 51G has to do with age-appropriate transition assessments. Measurable post-secondary goals are based on age-appropriate transition assessment. Assessments may include behavioral information. You see that laundry list kind of things there that we might include. Um, age-appropriate means the measure reflects the student's chronological age rather than developmental age. Now, it's very important that we understand that age-appropriate transition assessments need to be done from year to year. We need present levels that are informed. And when we say present, we mean present. We need age appropriate transition assessments that are not more than a year old. So in keeping with that, and you'll get a copy of this, uh, we have put in a, a website that we really, really like. Uh, it's the South Bend Community School Corporation website that gives you at your fingertips um, downloadable assessments for transition in the areas of education, training and employment, independent living, and it also gives you those that will um, help you with students that are in the middle school level or might be on the high school diploma track, or they might be on the high school alternate track, or they may have some life skills needs. So I love the way this is laid out. I use this in every transition training that I do. Uh, Brendan and I just really, really like the way uh, that this is, uh, is put together. And, it, and all you have to do is click on the link when you go to that site, and it will bring up that transition assessment. You can save that to a Word document, change the name, and you can go right uh, where you need to go and get transition assessments that are readily available because you need to do those to inform that present level each year. Okay, we can move. So you see this transition service needs in Infinite Campus. Uh, we identify the transition service and needs in Infinite Campus by check boxes. And, and so uh, we would need to, um, when we're looking at these transition assessments, we, we use these to determine the student's preferences and interests. And then we would address any barriers around the information that we get within the present level. And then we would come up with a plan and services that are needed to uh, attack uh, that uh, barrier or uh, find a transition service that's going to aid that student in developing skills that they're going to need to become employable uh, or to get training that they need to become employable and to uh, successfully transition into a job that's going to take care of them. Okay, go ahead. We can move on past that. It's kind of the same thing, just another screenshot. Uh, 51H, student involvement in the record review document. Uh, we need to make sure that we're inviting students to the um, meetings. Beginning at age 13, we need to invite students to every ARC meeting um, where transition services are discussed. Um, we see the area here on the, that's a better screenshot of the uh, uh, ARC notice, and you'll see they're right there pointing at, uh, well, it's supposed to be pointed at the student, but at least you see it's in the area there. So you would need to mark that on the notice every time. If you don't have that marked, uh, that's a correctable error. You can go back and fix that. Um, and there are some things you can fix according to the guidance document, and or I mean, I'm sorry, according to the record review document. And there's some things that you can't fix. The two things you can't fix is if you have a, an IEP that goes dead and is out of timeline, uh, that's gonna be a non-compliance. And if you have more than one of those, you're gonna be cited for that. Um, the other thing you can't fix is if you fail to get consent for an outside agency uh, uh, in the proper amount of time before the ARC uh, notice is generated. So those are two things you can't fix. Everything else we can help you with and we can clean up, uh, but we want to let you know that for sure. Uh, and and we on 51H, we invite the student. And if the student doesn't attend, we have the need to go out and discuss uh, the student's progression uh, in the multi-year course of study. And we need to have a robust conversation, uh, a, a real lively conversation with the student about where they're headed, uh, about whether or not they're on track. Are they uh, persisting to graduation? 
are are they doing the things that they need to be doing are they attending school enough those types of things and we need to capture that and document that in the conference summary okay so we can move on from this so uh, we come to this 51 i the measurable post-secondary goals are updated annually and and we know that uh, there are certain things that we need to do to make sure that they that the goals are updated annually now it's not enough just to have a uh, a current IEP, an IEP that's in compliance, an IEP that's current and, and it doesn't have a dead timeline, um, but there's more to it than that. And so if we'll move beyond, this is kind of a screenshot of what it looks like once we get the information. Here are the things that we must do. We must have a current IEP for, for meeting this uh, particular item on the record review document. We must inform the present levels and we must document. Now, what does that mean in a nutshell? Uh, first of all, we, we can't let IPs go dead. We know that. Second, secondarily, we must be performing these transition assessments yearly and taking the data and, and informing the present level. We don't need to be copying and pasting present levels from year to year to year to year to year. We need new transition assessment. We need to answer the question, is the transition assessment information still supporting the post-secondary goal? And is that post-secondary goal still appropriate for this student? If not, we need to change it and say so. If it's still appropriate, then we need to have that discussion in the conference summary and say, based on the transition assessments and the present levels at this time and the barriers and the goals and the services that we've set, we can say that the transition uh, goal has been, the post-secondary goal has been updated because we have new information in the present level and we've had that discussion. So we must document that all in the conference summary. Now, I just want to throw this thing up here too. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed in training, one of the things that we've noticed many, many times when we look at files, Brenda and myself, we all look at files for, and all of our uh, people here at KVEC uh, that are on the special ed staff have looked at files from time to time. And we've noticed that there's a void when it comes to uh, the anecdotal information that's included in uh, the transition present level. So we wanted to show you an exemplar example of what it looks like. Um, and, and so for transition needs, uh, you're gonna have strengths, you're gonna have needs identified, you're gonna have age appropriate transi transition assessment data, and you're gonna have some performance evaluation data that's gonna aid you in writing an appropriate post-secondary transition uh, present level. And so you see that, uh, you know, the yellow, this is color code. Now, that's why I love it. You can see the strengths are colored in, in purple or uh, uh, magenta or whatever color that is. Uh, and then you also can see that the needs are identified in orange. Uh, the uh, age appropriate transition assessment data is detailed in green. And of course, the performance evaluation data is captured in yellow. So uh, you can see that the ILP is alive and they've, uh, the present level has gleaned information from that that we can talk about and we can talk about where this student is headed and where they're, where they're going. And then we also see that uh, we've done some age appropriate transition assessment and we've got the information from that and it's identified the student to, to be uh, currently headed toward becoming a barber um, and where he's gonna go to school and that kind of thing. And if you can advance to the next slide, we'll see some more of the uh, rest of this. And we see that uh, they've also identified, they've done a good job on those check boxes. Sometimes you'll identify instruction as a need uh, for a service and you'll, or you'll check employment or you'll check independent living. But right here, they've checked instruction and they've checked employment and they've addressed it and they've broken it down into paragraphs that's here, uh, that are easy to read and they've put the good uh, anecdotal information in there. They've uh, talked about an adverse effect uh, and they have identified barriers that they need to overcome for this student. And this really is the focal point of the IEP. This present level is gonna inform the ARC of what goals need to be, uh, what goal needs to be set, what's, uh, what courses the student needs to be taking and what services we need to provide this student in order for them to have successful transition to post-secondary life. So we just wanted, to, we wanted to, you to see this example or example. We can move on. So again, um, updated annually includes previous IEP, current IEP, post-secondary goals are different, some form of change to the goal. Um, and, and if the goal hasn't changed, then we need to say 
based on transition assessments and based on the services that we've provided and where the student is at, where the student is actually performing uh, at this time, we know that we can uh, keep the goal the same and we can document that in the conference summary. I'd like to give a shout out to uh, Miss Dion Bates for running the slides for us, um, Brenda Combs for being in a su supporting role and giving the goody parts and, uh, and then also the rest of our staff here who uh, have always uh, contributed or, or contributed in some way to uh, the cadres. Um, all these folks are here for you. They're uh, willing to help. Uh, we got uh, an unbelievable staff. I just wanted you to see everybody's uh, avatar there. And um, I hope that uh, this cadre has been helpful. This is a, this is a quick version of uh, a larger uh, transition training that we do. Uh, Brenda and I have just recently done a new training around the record review document for 2021. And that, that'll be released soon. We're just doing some final editing on that. And um, we're certainly here for you if you have needs. Uh, we just want you to keep in mind that uh, this, is a, this is a very serious uh, important piece of documentation for students with disabilities once they hit age 13 and above uh, that we and, and especially at age 16 when you're you know if your district's audited or gets a desk review we can certainly come and help you and uh, but we want to get this training information out in, in, in as many venues and as many ways as we can uh, so that we can aid you and make uh, your job a little easier uh, in terms of compliance so that you can do the good stuff, which is instructing that student and creating that relationship and that engaging piece of instructing that student and guiding that student to successful transition.